you've got me today, and today I noticed in the bulletin, and I did notice it in the bulletin, is my 18th anniversary here. And uh, I just... Thank you. I, I have been reflecting. I started reflecting this morning, and I'm not going to reflect. I've, we got to take the youth to a hockey game after this, so I'm on a time schedule, and I know you all are praising the Lord for that. But uh, 18 years, and we, we originally, Beth and I originally came here because we wanted to be in a church that had something for our kids. And at, uh, 18 years ago, Brooke was just a toddler. Chelsea was just starting in elementary school, and I think April was fourth or fifth grade. And our children, uh, my girls, have grown up here. And they consider this their home church. When you're in ministry, a lot of times you don't have a home church. Uh, I mean, I've got one, Beth's got one, but this has become our home church. And my girls, this is how they look at it. They know, they don't even remember any other churches. It's always New Holland. And uh, that means a lot. Uh, I got thinking about the people and, and just highlights. I came here as part-time minister of music in 2000, whatever that was, 2011, 2001. Uh, I remember because Mike Taylor was out, Mike and Rick, I think, were out of the country when I talked to Mike, but uh, came here as part-time minister of music. Uh, the <coughs> minister of youth that we had left, and uh, Mike started doing youth, and so one day Mike said, I I've got to be gone, and I can't find anybody to do the youth tonight or on Wednesday night, and I said, well, I've, I've done youth before. I said, I'll fill in. I don't mind. I, it won't bother me. That's a one-time deal. I never left, and then the church considered me, and, I, and I, this is where I start remembering people. Uh, Glenn Dorsey came in my office and said, I understand. And Glenn, Glenn liked to get right in your face, and then, then he did this number. Got back. He said, I understand that they're talking to you about being our youth pastor. And, uh, and then he paused and he said, and I, pray, I just pray to God that you'll take it. And, and I did. And so I, then I was part-time minister of music and part-time minister of youth. And then after 19 years and 10 or 11 months, I got laid off at Cantor Machine. I'm walking to the halls, and people are saying, I said, I got laid off. People say, well, praise the Lord. It's like, well, I don't quite feel that way about it, but, you know. <laughs> never looked for a job. The church, not me, the church said, we want you full-time. And I've been full-time ever since as associate pastor. But I thought about people like Glenn. I thought about uh, a particular prayer that Frank Geddes prayed one day. The first time we had an orchestra, they were sitting right over here. And Frank Geddes opened his closing prayer with the fact that, Lord, we've never had an orchestra before, but we've got one. And, and it just meant a lot to me. And I got thinking, see, yesterday I did a funeral of, uh, for uh, Jocelyn Shockley, and, and I got close to Jocelyn. And I got thinking also how many people that you get close to and how many people, sadly enough, you have to say goodbye to. You know, I, always, I, I often think of Sherry Pilgrim. I mean, of what she meant to me. I just, she's meant a lot. I think of Janine, uh, Janine Smith. Uh, she meant so much to me. And I can't name all of them because I'd leave somebody out and somebody get mad and then, I wouldn't be here 18 years. I'd, I'd, have to get, I'd have to leave. But I just thought about that and all those people. But today we're going to talk about the feeble church. And I'm going to be honest with you. Now, I pray. I don't have a, I don't have a file that I say, well, let's see. I've got a day coming up. I'm going to just pull something out of the file. Uh, I have preached this message before. It was on a Sunday night. It's a message that had remained strong in my heart. It's a message that I wish I could preach everywhere. Because God spoke to me. The first time I preached, it was to the youth uh, at our winter, winter retreat last year. And it seemed to have an impact on them. It, it spoke to them. I did it here on a Sunday night that apparently the word got out I was preaching, so there weren't a whole lot of people here. Y'all must not check your email or <laughs> Facebook. And uh, the weird thing about the Sunday night is Brian said, well, I'm looking forward to seeing you on streaming. Well, the power was out that Sunday night. So we had one set of lights, and for some reason the sound system was on, but we didn't have any streaming. So it was really a strange night, but I prayed and I said, God, if you want me to preach something else, you need to let me know what it is. But I'm going to proceed, and I did proceed, and unless you change it, this is going to be the message. And this is the message. So today, if you'll take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, if you will stand in the honor of God's Word, and we won't have the words on the screen today because I preach out of the NIV and the New King James is what Brian preaches out of, and they don't, don't sell NIV anymore, I don't reckon. But anyway, Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, it says, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains, and is about to die. 
For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, and obey it, and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Father, it's in your hands. Speak to us. Father, I pray that you will open hearts, open ears, open minds. And Father, that we will consider strongly that which you have put before us today. Father, I pray for clearness, clear, clarity of voice, for clear speech, and Father, for a clear and, and focused mind. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you. Be seated. Well, I want to ask you, have you ever heard the term dead church? And what is a dead church? I mean, does a church have to be closed down to be dead? And uh, it, one thing that uh, the term we don't hear as much is the feeble church, but as far as the dead church, we've all heard this term. And when I think of this term, I think of a church in Richville, New York, went on a mission trip several years ago, of this beautiful church on the main, main drag in Richville, New York. Mitch, Richville is a small place. I mean, it's basically a siding, a siding, S-I-D-I-N-G, not a siding, a siding. And you can, you can pull through and travel, and it's just a little community. But Charles Finney, the great evangelist, back in 1825, this is where the Great Awakening, the second Great Awakening started. Revival broke out throughout America, and it started in this particular area, DeKalb, Richville, New York. Okay, in Richville, New York, they've got a historical society building. It's a white-framed church, what was a church, and they have uh, hauled in every kind of antique that you can think of. And basically now this beautiful church building, and it's beautiful. I mean, stained glass all around. It had the place in the back that actually is cut out that the pastor would speak. A big stained glass circle back there. Beautiful. The sun comes in the afternoon. It's just a beautiful thing. But yet, at some point, this church died. They don't have services there anymore. As you start in that community, there's also a little church called a United Church. And they meet once a year for what we would call as homecoming. But they don't meet. They don't worship. They don't... They don't carry on church as we think of it. It's dead and gone. But I don't think one day they just died and they were gone. They probably were dead a long time before they got to that point. But Charles Finney, the Great Awakening started there, yet it is no more. Well, why do churches die? Well, one thing that happens is we become complacent. We take everything for granted. And, and even as well as the worship has gone this morning, you know, we do basically the same, time, same thing every week. We're used to what is said. We're used to the messages. We're, we're, we know the Bible. But we take for granted all these things as going to be this way forever. It mentioned traditions. Traditions that come in our way. Now, and I'm a traditional guy. I, I'll just tell you, I like things the way they are. I, I fretted so much this past week because I'm, I'm not even that, that techie anymore. Technology has passed me by. I like paper. And so we're going to, we're going to hot. Yeah, amen. I get a witness out there. Go in the hockey game, you don't get a ticket anymore. You get to put it on your phone. Well, I got 30 people. What am I going to do? I've got to go. It's, and it's just, well, anyway, it went dead on me Friday and the tickets went away. <laughs> Needless to say, my nerves were kind of gone. But I, I thought, why would it not be easier just to send me a ticket in the mail? But they don't do it. Things change. Things change. We don't have pump organs anymore. There's not oil lights. We have electricity now, chandeliers. All the technology you could want. And a lot of times I think these things replace what church is all about. And maybe the last time I preached this, the power went off and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, this is, this is really nostalgic. But it's what happens. We, we just become used to just being here. How about prejudice or unwillingness to minister to a changing neighborhood? You know, God planted us here. But a lot of times it's like we scratch our head and it's like, well, what do we do for our neighborhood? We can work neighborhoods here, there, but in our neighborhood is in transition, but what do we do? How do we minister? Do we, do we pay attention to it or we ignore it? Lack of evangelism. How, how fer what kind of fervor do we have when we preach the gospel? 
Where would I be without the gospel? See, and I get, to, I get to do funerals, and I get to sit in my office. I get to see the hospital people in their worst times, and, and they're in need of the gospel. They come to the point they have no hope. Have we forgotten that? Where did you come from before you were saved? What has God done? Where would you be without God? What about the disparity between large and small churches? The church our size is basically going away in America. People shop for churches now before they pray about it. What can the church give to me? What, what, what is in it for me? Y'all see that? It is. It is. Well, let's talk about Sardis. And I always, I always think this is kind of humorous. Uh, what they named churches. You know, Sardis, Sardis was not a red-letter church as far as it goes, but they named, somebody named it Sardis. I went to Corinth, and Corinth, I guess, and Sandra, you know what I'm talking about. Corinth means sin city. It's like, well, let's name the church sin city, you know. <laughs> it's in the Bible. <laughs> and Sardis, see, Sardis was not anything, really, Sardis was not anything that would, you would take note of and say, this is something that I want to, we want our church to be like, is Sardis. But Sardis was a very rich area. It was once ruled by a king by the name of Croesus, and his name, you would probably know him more as Midas, and that's where the Midas touch comes from. It was located at the intersection of five major roads. It had a beautiful acropolis, and I had to look that word up, and that means fort, fortress. And uh, it's all known, uh, you'll, get, you'll get a kick out of this. It was also known for their necropolis. Now, a necropolis is, is a cemetery, cemetery. You know, I thank God we don't have a cemetery. I was in a church one time, had a war over the cemetery. And the church actually became known for the cemetery. It's the nicest cemetery you've ever seen. That church down there. I think I'm going to go there. That maybe I can get buried there. You know, I mean, the people, people look at funny things. They were known for the teachings of Artemis. It was once a glorious city, but it was in decline. But it also said they were living on past glories. And one time they were conquered because the sentry fell asleep. The sentry fell asleep. And that's, that's no. Well, let's look at the Bible. Revelation 3.1 says, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who hold the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Now, when it says the angel of the church of Sardis, automatically, I've always thought that meant the pastor. But there were seven, on, seven envoys that were sent by the seven churches to check on John. John was on the Isle of Patmos, and so they sent him to check on John. So there were messengers. And so the real thrust of this is to the messengers of the churches. So they carried the message. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits and the seven stars. Now, when we talk about the seven spirits of God, we talk, talk about the fact that the spirit is full and complete. And if you looked in Revelation, I mean, in, in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, here's what it says. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. So there's this completeness of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's the same spirit that we have right now in our hearts, yet we behave and act as if we have no power. The spirit of God will rest upon him means that, that God will occupy him. God will occupy the Savior, and he did. The spirit of wisdom means insight, discernment, sensitivity, the gift of insight. The spirit of understanding, the revelation of God, knowing how to interpret God's word, how God reveals himself. The spirit of counsel, the counselor, the encourager, how we need encouragers today. The spirit of power, not timidity. You know, the church is very timid today. We walk around with fear, but he's saying, no, not timidity, but power. We have all the power in the world, and yet we're timid. We're shy. We're afraid. We look at these walls, at this room as a place of security, 
and not a place for the recharge to get ready to go out and affect the world that's outside the walls. The church has become sometimes a social club. We look at our fellowship and what is done for us, and we think that's it. That's what church is about. But we are timid, but we have all the power in the world. The spirit of knowledge, enlightenment, equipping, and truth, knowing what the truth is. This is a world where the truth is lacking. People don't know the truth. People think that the truth is something relative to themselves. In other words, the truth for me is something different than it would be for my brother Jason here. But that's not it. Truth is truth, and it's absolute. But yet the world is greatly lacking in truth. The spirit of fear of the Lord. Have you heard today how, people, how quickly people will use God's name as a way to emphasize speech? God. God's name. It's like it's flippant. It's like it means nothing. It's like it's common. Now, fear of the Lord doesn't mean that I'm sitting here just trembling in fear of uh, going to be hurt by God. But what has happened to the reverence and respect that is owed to a holy and righteous God? The spirit of fear means that I will have a desire in my heart to worship God. See, I mean, this is a good crowd. But how far will we have to go before we find somebody skipping church at home this morning? I had a preacher one time said, you know, the best time for visitation would probably be Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Of course, uh, <laughs> churches, don't do, you know, churches don't really do visitation anymore. It's so dangerous out there. And, uh, Beth and I, I mean, we had the Jehovah's Witnesses come by one, one day, and, you know, of course, the conversation. Now, Michael Dunnigan, he looks at that. It's, it's a great time for debate and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, one, one Saturday morning I told Beth, I said, be quiet. <laughs> Just don't say nothing. <laughs> they, they know, folks. They know who goes to church and who doesn't. They know. And we do too. Christ possessed the fullness of the Holy Spirit. What God does, he does not do halfway. When he equips us, when he has endowed us, endued us, endowed us, to that what's going to be endued us with the Holy Spirit, it's complete. We can have it complete in our lives. But yet if we walk around in sin, God's not able to use us. The Spirit's not able to work through us. And he also says, and the seven stars, and there's where he's talking to the pastors. He holds the seven stars in his hands. And what this also says is the fact that the seven stars are responsible to Jesus Christ. We are responsible as preachers, as pastors, for what you hear, for much of your behavior, though we can't help that, but we're responsible. He says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive. Now, the last time I preached this, I had a, listen, I don't have everything written down, but things just pop in there sometimes. And I use an example. I guess it's because I work at the funeral home sometime. Clinton works at the funeral home, so you see some things. And, you know, what do they do with a corpse? They embalm it, and then they dress it up, and they put it in a casket, and so, so we can all go by and say, don't they look so good? They just look so natural and all this kind of stuff. You know, you dress up, of course, but the thing is, it's dead. There is no life. Friday night, I went in to the visitation for Jocelyn, and Jocelyn looked good. Now, there I said it too. But I put my hand on her hand. It was cold. Death had come. Now, she's in a better place. But the body can be dressed up to look good. Hey, let me ask you something. Can we not dress ourselves up and look good but have no substance behind it? Just because we dress up and we've got everything going on, does that mean we're alive? Death means there is no action. There is no life. A dead church can have a small amount of activity. Now, we're church people. We're busy as they come. But that does not in itself equal life just because you're busy. 
Everybody's busy. But it, that doesn't mean you're alive. A lot of it could be a routine. The routine looks alive. It said about this church, one thing I thought was interesting, they were not a bother nor a threat to anyone. When people looked at Sardis, they thought, those are some fine people. But as far as in the marketplace, in the world, they had no influence at all. None. The Savior says, but you are dead. Nothing happening. No prayer. No discipleship. No evangelism. No truth. Ear-tickling messages. Y'all have heard that term before, haven't you? Make me feel good when I come to church. I just go to church to feel good. Empty, man-pleasing worship. It had no influence whatsoever. Revelation 2 says, Wake up, strengthen what remains, and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Now, he changes his terminology here from death to sleep. A noticeable change to sleep. Now he's talking like they're asleep. Now, why is that good for us? That, that says that there is still hope if we're just asleep. Wake up. Have you ever woke up and not known where you're at? Have you ever driven to work or something and don't know how you got there? You know what it's like to sleep. But you also know what it's like to be alert. I heard more people talking this morning about how bad that they slept last night. Why? Because they were afraid they were going to be late for church. Well, it looks to me like this time change, you have more of an opportunity to be on time for church. <laughs> but you know what it's like to be in that kind of stupor from sleep to where you're, you're not really aware of what's going on. And I think many times the church today is not dead. Our church is not dead. This church is not dead. But this is a warning from the scriptures that it could be because we get so used to what's going on that we don't pay attention to the true needs of the people around us and the church itself. Need to be alert. He says, for I found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. The task is not complete. You know, you're not finished yet. I mean, this retirement mentality of the church is killing the church today that once I reach 65, I, I, I'm done. I've done, I've, I've done my time. I don't need to do that anymore. I hope I go till I die. I don't want to be, I don't want to be this kind of person that gets old and in their ways and gets in the way. You know, I, we always done it that way when I was a kid. I know I don't do that. But the thing is, is I want to be relevant for my entire life. I don't see any retirement in Christian circles. But yet we've got the mentality that this is what happens. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance, patience, the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he says there, run with perseverance, staying with it. There's someone that in ministry that I heard had just stepped away from ministry probably six, seven months ago. And this person came up in conversation, and I asked, I said, would this person be willing to possibly work, to take on some responsibilities, to, to get back in there? And the person told me, he said, no. No, the, the word we got is they're done. Done. At my age, done. But it happens all the time. It happens all the time. People fall away from ministry, from the church. You know, I can't see the clock. <laughs> no, 12, it's 12.30, I heard that. <laughs> All right, here, I, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pop the clutch and shift it into another gear. He says in verse 3 of chapter 3, Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. 
but if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. So the thing is, he says, first of all, remember, I constantly have to remind myself of what God has done for me. I'm saved today. I'm going to heaven. It's not a matter of having to wonder about it. I remember that. I'll never forget it. But he says we should remember. Can you remember that time? Can you remember? Then he also says, obey what we've learned. It's very simple to come back to God, to obey what we've learned, to what we've heard, what we've been taught our entire lives. We don't have to learn what to do. We know what to do. Just do it. Just do it. And before I go any further, I'm not, now this message is not geared toward putting a volunteers list out here in the, in the Welcome Center to get you to do something. But the thing is, when we're teaching about the church triumphant, and that's all good. I, my forte is preaching to the church about the church. But see, the thing that we've got to remember many times is this. When you're preaching about the church, you're preaching to individuals because the church triumphant will be made up of Christians triumphant. And yet we, we preach and we all hide under the guise or the umbrella of the church. Well, he's preaching to the church. That's all of us. Well, it is all of us, but it comes down to this. It comes down to the individual. Where are you? I even stepped off there. Where are you in your Christian walk? You're not here to hear me speak today. We're not here to, just to sing. We are here to find God new in our lives, to come back to where we are. There are people dealing with things today in their lives, and they don't know where to turn. There are lives that are in turmoil, people on a downward spiral, and there is an answer today. It doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to live that way. But yet we will come in here, go through the routine, and yet walk out the same way as when we got here. It doesn't have to be that way. He says, remember, well, we can remember, obey. And then he says something that's very, very unpopular. He says to repent. To repent. I had a pastor that preached on repentance several times one time, and a deacon came to him and said, Pastor, you might as well quit preaching on that because everybody's repented that's going to repent. <laughs> it's funny. That's true, isn't it? But is it right? No, it's not. Why, why, why do we walk around the same way that we came in this place? Today, the opportunity is to walk out of there and be right with God, for your life to be different, for it to be changed. And change is good, unless it has to do with tickets for the hockey game. That's not a good change. <laughs> I'm going to move ahead because I think that God is moving me ahead. Now this is, this is something I want you to hear exactly what I'm saying and follow me before you make any decisions or make any assumptions. And this is why I think this message would preach anywhere. But today we have become, in the church at large, the church near and far, have gotten into a hospice mentality hospice mentality. Y'all know what hospice is. Our first, uh, my first experience with hospice was with mom and then with dad. And it is a great thing because they, they give the greatest care and they, they have insight into what's going on. But yet when you're under hospice care, with all due respect, doesn't that say that the end is near? I appreciate those that work in that ministry. But the, the, the role of hospice is to keep the suffering low, keep the pain low, and maybe a way to say it is to keep them easy while they're waiting on death. See, I contend today that the church has gotten in this mindset that it's basically just waiting for death. We have become the hospice church, or churches are becoming the hospice church. We're not there yet. But is that not true? Just keep me easy until that time comes I go to be with Jesus. A lot of, a lot of times you find, and I've found in ministry, that the last thing that, that God has done for some people, or the last thing people have received from God is their salvation, and they're not going to step further. 
that is a sad narrative on where we're at. What's it going to be today? Are we going to be hospice Christians? Does it not bother us, the state of the world we're in? Do we, not, do we not feel like we can do more for the Lord? And like I said, I'm not putting a volunteers list out for anything. My thought right now is you. You, the individual. Where is your life? How is your life? How is your walk with God? I can testify today that it's a whole lot sweeter to walk with God than to fight against him. We're going to have a time of invitation. I'm not asking for a big show of people coming to the altar. Matter of fact, don't come to the altar unless God makes you or tells you to come to the altar. But I just ask that while we sing Amazing Grace that you consider with that, that, that dear hymn, that familiar hymn, that familiar song that we've always sung, that you think about the words. We're going to do all four stanzas. And that you will consider what God is saying to us today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Praise team, come forward. We're going up on the last verse. Our Father, we are thankful to be here. I'm thankful for this time I've been allowed to speak. Father, I pray that the message has come through. Father, I pray for each and every soul that's here this morning. I pray, God, that today that lives will be changed. I pray that today someone will walk close with you, Father, that may not as well we walk with you close in a long time. Father, I pray for that person today that's especially burdened, that has that struggle and is looking for strength. Father, I pray that today they will find it. Father, I pray for this church collectively that we will be all that we're supposed to be. Not because of what everyone else is doing, God, but because of the fact that you have empowered us to reach this world. Father, may our arms and hearts continue to be open to each other. Do strengthen our fellowship, make it strong. And Father, move and do a mighty, mighty work. A work that you can only get the, the, the praise for in our midst today. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.